It's time now for the Sports Objective Podcast. No talking heads, just guys who love sports. Here's Dave Richmond. Welcome into the Sports Objective Podcast. I'm Dave Richmond along with Kyle from the Green Barber. What's up, dude? What's going on, man? You feeling like a villain? Feeling like a villain? I'm here looking at the Christmas tree that my wife already has up. I saw that, man. You guys are... Uh, you got- I uh, can't beat the barbers, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's well, there, 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 there is a reason behind that. My wife has to have minor surgery tomorrow, so I'm going to go ahead and get it up to see if I'm going to be able to lift things for a couple of weeks. So. That explains everything. I did not know. I did not know that. Uh, Bubba Rosenbaum, what's up, dude? What's going on, guys? Um, I'm still falling out from last night. I'll tell you what, up there, um, there was snow on the ground in Boone, and the, the real feel was one. It gives me flashbacks to the fall of 91. I was actually a freshman at Lee's McCray. I transferred in my sophomore year to East Carolina. And, man, I remember it snowed and it snowed and it snowed from October all the way up to there was snow even up at Sugar Mountain in May. The night, the night Last night I was there, uh, my first year of college, it was still snow on the ground, so on the mountain so in May. So it's like snow, snow, and more snow. And, I think one of these days we'll have a we'll have to uh, go visit Kyle, being living in. You are in correct. You're, 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 you're hopefully at some point, yes, you will. Um, so we'll look at we'll talk about that at a, another time for sure, guys. Uh, it seems to be a busy off week. It's supposed to be we're supposed to be off this week, but uh, lots of stuff to talk about. I got, I'm going to throw this out to you guys first. Uh, by the way, before I forget, let me before I even get into that. Happy birthday to Holt Naylor's, our starting quarterback for East Carolina. Really proud of him and his progressions. Uh, the last couple of weeks, he's just uh, the game has slowed down for him, and really proud of him. We can talk more about that. Yeah. Uh, I want to before we start dive, take a deep dive in East Carolina. Hey, well, uh, wait a minute wait, before you do that. Okay. Let, let, let's tell the listeners why they're here. We we got Ryan Robinson and uh, Brandon Simmons coming your way later in the podcast. Yes, we got two big guests, and uh, certainly that's going to be cool. Uh, we're going to start off with a roundtable. Hey, uh, how about this? How about the – I want to get your thoughts on both of you. I'm going to pitch this uh, to both of you on this, on the the uh, rankings last night that came out Tuesday night for the college football playoff, LSU number one, Ohio State two, and then you had Clemson three, and then Georgia moved up to fourth. Uh, that was uh, that was a shocker, a surprise. Our good buddy there Mike he called Ray. it. Yes, he did. So I got to give I got to give uh, Mr. Gallagher, Mr. Please don't call me SEC Gallagher, um, right, Terry? SEC Gallagher. Um, I thought he's gonna kill me for saying that. I'm being sarcastic. Terry can't stand the SEC. Um, but how, what did you guys think? Alabama number five. It sounds it actually sounds uh, it's like ridiculous. They got it right. It's, it's ridiculous. No, it's ridiculous. Georgia has no business being in top four. They lost to South Carolina. That's a bad loss. South Carolina's a bad football team. But they um, have two top. They have two top twenty-five. A good. I, I don't care, them. man. It, it, you might as well just. You might as well just let the whole SEC in. And Clemson. Yeah. How about how about their conference schedule? The ACC is yeah. not garbage. Um, no. What about Oregon? What about Oklahoma? Uh, you know, Oregon. Uh, Oregon definitely deserves. Uh, I, I don't understand how Oregon and um, you can make a case even for Utah as well. Right there, they're right near each other. They're Baylor. The what about Baylor? I mean, I, I don't. Yeah. I, you know, it's 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 nonsense to me at this point. You, you got to go to eight, and you know, I, I don't know at what point some of these power conferences are going to get tired of just getting a paycheck to the SEC's invited club and uh, put their foot down and say, look, screw this. We're going to have to share this money a little more. Go to eight. And, uh, you know, hope at that point, I think you'd have the group of five have to get one of the playoff spots. Or the American may just get it. I- I'm telling you, the way this conference is going, at that point, if they go to eight and they take the conference champions, you throw boys and state and BYU in with what's already in the American, there's no doubt it's a power conference. But you asked about the rankings. Um, I guess I'm all right with Clemson being in there, even though I think their uh, their schedule is garbage. Um, Georgia does not deserve to be in the top four. Bubba, what do you think? I agree. Um, I, 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 I like Terry. I was not surprised that Georgia was fourth in a way. Um, 
because like Dave referenced, you, you had those, um, you had the wins over, over Florida and Notre Dame, but like you said, Kyle, that, that loss to South Carolina, man, uh, and if I was doing the rankings right now, uh, my number four would be Alabama. As, as much as I'm not an Alabama fan, I'm just, I mean, just looking at it objectively, Alabama versus Georgia, I think, I think Alabama's the better team. Now, could Georgia beat Alabama? Sure they could. I mean, they've been right there, but, um, I think if Alabama and Georgia play ten times, that Alabama would probably win at least eight or nine. Right? Seven, yeah, at least seven of them. Yeah. I, 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 I'd probably have Oregon four guys. I mean, it's, if let's just let's just crown the SEC champion, the national champion. If all we're going to do is put this SEC team in or that SEC team in, and if this one right. in, that was going to be in. Well, let's just make the SEC champion, the national champion, and be done with it. And here's a, and guys, here, it, I just sorry, I was very quick. Very, say, Sorry, guys. I was just going to quickly say, why don't we do like my idea of having four SEC teams to the playoff, and then that way uh, we'll finally get we'll sacrificed oh, one just, year. We'll just eliminate the playoffs. Well, I'll get what you're saying. Well, you know what? The committee may 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 uh, may screw up one of these times and put three in. And uh, you know, I, I'm telling you, at some point, the Pac-12, the Pac-12 is getting. They should. The Pac-12 should team up with the American. And, and, the, and well, the Big Club, club. the Big Club is getting screwed this year too. And I mean, then they, yeah, and another that's true. Yeah, I mean it's it's like I said, it, at some point, some of these other so-called power conferences has got to be tired of just getting a paycheck and uh, do what's right for them and, and the rest of the conferences. What were you going to say? About? To, I was going to say a couple of things. One, um, from our perspective, we we just simply want as much controversy and as many teams that are uh, that are. They really feel like they can stake a claim to that top four as we can. And I'm like, not that I necessarily think it's going to happen because I really don't. But um, if let's say Baylor wins the Big Twelve, they're undefeated. They take care of business against Oklahoma and run the table. Uh, and, and then also, uh, let's say that somehow Minnesota ran the table and and beat Ohio State. Definitely don't think it's going to happen. But if it did, and, and what, what are you going to have? Uh, you're going to have one of those two maybe maybe get left out, or I mean. We we just want controversy. <laughs> yeah, I mean exactly. That would be what's best for the American. And uh, guys, I had looked at the at the entire conference five. Uh, where did the American teams in Boise State check in? Uh, let's see. Uh, we had there were five group of five teams in uh, the high the highest ranked group of five team was Cincinnati, and, and the Bearcats came in at seventeenth, I believe it was. I think Cincinnati. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Following up on behind Cincinnati was uh, Memphis. I believe the Tigers were 18th, and um, the third so-called Group of Five team was uh, Boise State. Uh, the Broncos were 21st, and then Navy was 23rd, and then App State to repl- replaced SMU at 25th. So we knocked out SMU, huh? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> By not beating them. Um, <laughs> With spoilers. There you go. Um, so we, we 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 got three teams in, plus a Sun Belt, plus a uh, a Mountain West. So uh, you know, and I tell you, I tell you an interesting thing about Memphis. They're in a bad situation um, potentially. They may have to beat Cincinnati two weekends in a row. Oh, that's to make, right. To make the, uh, the the Sugar Bowl, or excuse me, the Cotton Bowl, because if they beat Memphis, excuse me, if Memphis wins out. They win their next. They win their next game and then beat Cincinnati to close the year. Cincinnati would still win the East as long as they take care of business. Right. Um, the rest of the way, but they got one or two more games left. Cincinnati, you guys know. The two. Yep. Uh, Cincinnati also. Two. Cincinnati also has Temple. You got Memphis and Temple. That's it. Yeah. T- uh, Temp- T- Temple comes to Nippert Stadium and then they uh, and then they go as- to uh, Memphis. Yep. So as long as they beat Temple, if Memphis beats them, Cincinnati will still represent the East, and then you'll you'll have a situation where Memphis will have to turn around and beat Cincinnati again the very next week. <laughs> Whereas wow. if, if Cincinnati beats Memphis, um, you, you could have uh, at that point um, if Navy beats SMU, the winner of SMU Navy would win the West if Cincinnati beats Memphis. That's what I'm trying to say. So, um, 
It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, it really is. Bad scheduling, by the way. Uh, the American, and I know Cincinnati Memphis is a rivalry game, and I, and, I, and I guess for the next two years we're not going to have divisions, so it doesn't matter. But when we go back to divisions, we need to make sure we don't schedule any East-West games of uh, the last week of the year because it potentially sets up matchups like that. Yeah, for sure. Here's the part we're going to have to edit. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so I feel uh, strongly about the, the American. I felt all the time in the history of this podcast, Kyle has been saying about we would have to sue the group of five or at least American or maybe even some of the Power Five conferences. But uh, as strong as – it's not that I didn't agree with you, Kyle, but the, every day that goes by, the more I think that's going to – you mean you mean that you mean the American and the, and other conferences of the Group of Five would have to sue the the the, the Power Five or the NCAA? Yes, it, it, it may happen. It may have to happen. I don't know. I'll I'll tell you again. I, I, the American teams get more and more respect, and particularly I've noticed from ESPN and ABC. So it's going to be interesting to see if that trend continues. Um, if, if they're our ally. And, and I think when you when you when you sign a contract to pay somebody eight million a year, uh, you, you tend to maybe start treating them a little different than somebody you're paying a million a year, even though a million dollars is a lot of money to you and I. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? They're paying us eight million dollars per team per year, so you, you would think they'd want that product to be perceived as strong as possible. Absolutely, guys. Y'all want to go to our first guest, uh, and then we'll come back and, and talk some pirate basketball. Um, we uh a friend of mine uh named Natalie Pridgen um lost her nephew a couple years back. Uh his name was Harrison and uh they've started a charity in honor of him called Hugs from Harrison and uh they're going to be taking up toys. There's drop off spots that is all throughout Lenore and Green County and all the toys are gonna be given to the James and Connie Maynard Children's Hospital in Greenville and uh I called up with Natalie to get details about the uh, about the toy drive uh, earlier today. So let's go to that interview now. Right now, we're joined by Natalie Pridgen and Mike Pridgen, if Mike will participate. And uh, they're they're uh, they're started they started a charity called Hugs from Harrison. And uh, Harrison was a very special little boy. And uh, we're going to tell you about the charity, but first, we're going to tell you a little about Harrison. And I'm going to let Natalie do that. So, uh, Natalie, tell us uh, tell us about Harrison and your relationship with him, and uh, just about his life. Harrison. Our nephew, um, I started keeping him when he was six weeks old, him and his twin brother Jackson. And um, he was like one of ours. And in December of, excuse me, in September of 2017, we found out Harrison had a brain tumor. And when uh, they operated and done two surgeries, it turned out that it was glioblastoma. It was grade four cancer. Um, Harrison did chemo and radiation and it wasn't doing any good so they stopped and in 2000 december 2017 um harrison passed away and how how old was harrison when he did pass away and and just talk about you know he has a twin brother and just the impact he had while he was here harrison was um seven years old when we found out that he had cancer and he passed away when he was eight. He was a very giving child. He would um, go and, and get stuff to his mom and throw it in the trash can and bring and give to you if he thought it was of value. He um, called it dumpster diving. So he liked to give, he liked to give. And we felt that this charity, to give children toys at Christmas at the James and Connie Maynard's Children's Hospital in Greenville would be very appropriate in Harrison's memory. Yeah, and the charity's called Hugs from Harrison, and uh, just what she said, uh, similar to Toys from Tots, we're collecting toys, but they're all going to go to children at the James and Connie Maynard Children's Hospital in Greenville. Um, and uh, talk about um, the kind of things we're, we're looking to get, where where the, the toys and items can be donated, the age range of the children, and uh, when they need to have it by. Okay. Um, the ages are infant to teenager. I, w I would guess 19 as far as it would go. 
um, anything from teethers, rattlers, musical mobiles for the babies, blankets, you can take blankets, your basic toys, cars, trucks, puzzles, coloring books, building blocks, Lego, baby dolls, Barbies, stuffed animals. And uh, as Natalie was saying, Barbie dolls, uh, cars, trucks, anything, anything for infant all the way up through teenager, uh, probably maybe some gift cards even for teenagers. Yeah, teenagers, gift cards and gift cards, and if anybody wants to buy like Xbox games or anything like that, they'll take it too. Xbox, PlayStation, <laughs> I mean, I anything you could think of that, the, you know, that a child uh, up to a teen from, from like she's saying, from an infant all the way up to 18, 19, uh, may be able to use, you know, particularly you know, you know, Christmas gifts and, and also, you know, if, if all the toys aren't given out at Christmas, yeah. they'll be saved for if other occasions. an abundance of toys given and they're not all given out for Christmas, they'll save them for um, coming off chemo parties, birthday parties, anything to celebrate while they're in there and put a smile on their face. And where, where can people donate the, the toys? We have a drop-off box at uh, Big Game Brewing in Kinston, uh, Lions Industries for the Blind in Kinston. Fat Baby's Country Cooking in Kinston, Grandma's at it in Kinston, and you can also contact me if I need to pick up, meet and pick up, I will. My number is 252-933-9569. And wasn't there also a location in, in Green County for drop-off? Yes, at um, Green County High School. So Green, Green Central. City, Green Central High Green School. Green Central High School. Okay, so for, for all our listeners that are... In First PH church in kinston first ph church in kinston and, and a lot of our listeners will be in the greenville area so your, your closest drop off would be green central but if not make it over to kinston and if you got a bunch of toys to drop off just contact natalie and she'll figure it out you know she, pick them up. and what's your number one more time natalie 252-933-9569 okay and uh guys uh want to have them all in by when December the 16th. December 16th. So between now and December 16th, any of those locations, you can you can call Natalie at the number given. You can email me at thesportsobjective at gmail.com. I'll be willing to give you any information if you don't get it on the podcast. And, There's a Facebook page. And the Facebook page. Yes, thank you, Natalie. Yeah, go like the Facebook page. And the Facebook page is Hugs from Harrison. Right. And just go like the Facebook page. And I'm we'll, we'll share that Facebook page on the Sports Objective Facebook page. And uh, need to need to make this a big success and uh, give back to sick kids in Eastern North Carolina in the memory of of uh, of Harrison. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalie. Um, and guys, uh, it's, it's four great calls. So everybody out there, go to the drop off spot. Take toys. I mean, toys for tots is a great fundraiser. You know, so give to both. You know, you don't have to choose one or the other. Uh, these are going to go to sick children. At the Children's Hospital there in Greenville, and it's in memory of a very special little boy. And uh, you know, go donate some toys. You can go to our Facebook page, and we'll have the link to the Facebook page for the Hugs from Harrison fundraiser. And uh, you can go get more details on drop-off locations, etc. And uh, like I said, it's a great cause. And and go get some toys to some to some kids that need some cheering up at Christmas time. That was a great, great interview. Great job. Uh, our special correspondent there, Kyle from the Great Square, you did a great job, my friend. Well, thank you, brother. And a great call, and uh, we'll keep an eye on that uh, for sure between now and uh, the next few weeks, for sure, with yeah, everything going on. Yeah, the the interview, December 16th. Just yeah. Between now and December 16th. So that'll be uh, great. We'll keep an eye on that. We'll talk about We'll keep uh, talking about that next few weeks um, into the middle of December, like Kyle said. So, Gentlemen, the uh, one of the things I want to talk about uh, on this podcast: disappointing night in Boone. I know um, another one of our special correspondents, Bubba Rosenbaum, was at the game last night. You drove up to Boone. Um, can you give your thoughts before Kyle and I? We'll let you take the floor now. Yeah, guys. Um, needless to say, we got off to a very poor start last night, falling behind eleven to nothing right out of the gate, and we didn't have a not, and didn't have a bucket, but didn't have a point in the first five plus minutes. Um, and then we started to chip away from that point. And so, um, so yeah, and we started to chip away at the lead and, and really, um, 
started to limit some of those uh, silly mistakes we made early on and just finally had some shots go down. Uh, J.J. Miles knocked in a couple of threes and uh, maybe another perimeter shot. And uh, unfortunately, he cooled off in the second half. And I think over the course of the year that J.J. Miles will be a, be an excellent three-point shooter for us. I really do. He has a nice shot. Um, and some of those, I think he finished the game maybe like two out of eight from three, two out of eight and two out of nine. But – those misses, uh, the majority of them um, were, were close, and, uh, and he had a couple that looked looked dead and went went in and out. So uh, I was encouraged with what I saw there. Um, Seth Leday had a really nice night, 20 points and seven rebounds in like 24, 25 minutes, and uh, so he was a certain uh, he was a bright spot to be certain. And then also uh, you had Brandon Suggs, and another you had a freshman like him uh, who had a solid outing, I think 12 or 13 points. But one of the things that really stood out, and I know I told you this, Dave, off the air, is um, how much better we shot free throws because yes. we, we only shot like 36% from the floor and like 23% from three, five out of 23 or so. But uh, we knocked down 15 out of 19 from the free throw line, and that really helped us uh, stay in the ball game. You know, one thing, uh, that was that's one thing that I always, uh, as a, Player as a as a coach when I was coaching my my basketball teams, I told him uh, free throws are a difference between a good team and a great team. And prac we practice uh, when we were doing practice, guys. What we did is we shot free throws at the beginning of practice. We would shoot uh, free throws uh, during practice in the middle, and then right at the end of practice, we shoot it to simulate how they would feel. You know, obviously it's not game speed or anything like that, but just try to give them a feel of what it's like to shoot free throws when you're tired, you know, when you're uh, fresh, all that kind of stuff. But I've always – free throws are a big deal, and it just drives me nuts. I remember the uh, – was it the – Well, you know, Dave, Dave, if there's one thing we've learned from the Minji's Maniacs, free throws win ball games. woo. The ECU pep band. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> pep band? Well, either way. Either way. But, but, <laughs> Uh, but yes, uh, no. That's the one thing that drives me crazy is the free throws. And uh, I think oh, one thing I wanted to mention about the team too, um, the way that I'll put this is, I think that one of the problems we we speculated could be a problem, and I think it already is, guys. I, I think the chemistry is not there, um, but it'll take time for that chemistry uh, to work things out. And uh, one of the things that I have to remind myself is these are. 11 new guys, and no excuses, absolutely no excuses, just saying that I need to keep in check, and hopefully Pirate fans will, um, about the expectations, I think. What well, bothered me, and granted, and, and, you know, I'd like to hear Coach Dilly comment on this, because maybe what I was seeing was guys that didn't know quite what they were doing just yet, but I thought at times I thought some guys weren't giving as much effort as they could, it, or certainly looked like App State was giving more effort than us. And I, I would. Sorry, go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, and I, I can't, I can't stand that. If, if you lose the game because somebody's better than you, because they got more talent, right. or because they're executing better, or just they're hot that night. But when at times it looked like it was an effort thing. That really pisses me off, and I know Dooley's not going to put up with it. And that's yeah. exactly right. When you look at last year, guys, we have way more talent this year. But if you look at last year's team, we didn't have a third of the talent we have now. I mean, not even that. And now, uh, one of the things that kept those guys in the games last year, they were not American talent. And the thing that kept us in the games were, uh, was the fact that we were able to play hard, um, especially defense. We played, uh, uh, good defense most of the time. Sometimes we didn't, but, um, but this year, uh, we're going to have to, even though we have talent, if you don't have the effort, then it's, it's like you don't have talent. I guess it's the same. A different way to say the same thing, Kyle. I mean, we, we got to have. It doesn't matter. Who cares if you? Same thing. It doesn't matter what sports you're playing. Just because you have the most talent on paper, you still have to play the game. So, yeah. Um, that. Uh, by the way, guys, I want to also mention. Um, Sorry, Bob. If you want to say something else, go ahead. Being there in person and watching it, uh, I would certainly agree with what Kyle was saying as far as um, there were times where I don't know if guys were confused. Um, whether it was slow on a closeout, um, getting not getting a, not getting a hand in somebody's face, um, I know that happened a time with Bibby on a corner three in the first half, 
And then um, there were also times where um, where guys didn't box out well. Appalachian did a terrific job of boxing out. Uh, and we, we actually held a one-rebound advantage in the game, which was surprising, I think, maybe because some of the putback opportunities that, that they got at critical times and things of that nature. But, um, but yeah, there, there were – a few times where guys were immediately pulled from the game because of uh, not hustling after loose balls and so forth. Yeah, it was, uh, and, and it seems like guys and uh, that our our smaller lineups have been our more successful lineup. Why haven't we been able to take advantage of our size? This is, I think one of the things that Coach Dewey talked about is the very fact that what's happening now is some when we're playing these early games, they don't have. In other words, we have the size. The reason why we got the size is to compete in the American. Okay, so we have the tall guys. The problem we're having is that when there's mismatch uh, with the non-conference schedule, because we've got guys now uh, that were playing early on in the non-conference schedule that are are smaller guys. So our big guys are having to go out there on the wing, and they're not being able to be rim protectors. Uh, and you know, some people may say again that's an excuse, but mix, mismatches are a big part of basketball. And so what we're having to do right now is there's times when we're going to have to go small to match up better with those uh, teams that maybe don't have the the height. That It's kind of like the East Carolina of old where we didn't have the height. Yeah, well, why can't we just get the ball to the perimeter and throw it to our tall guys and say, go lay it up? It's not the – yeah, the offense is not the problem. It's the defense, I think, more more so has been uh, the issue. But what do you think, Bubba? No, I was just going to expand on what you were saying, Dave, as far as the bigs. Um, you know, Luigi last night, um, Luigi played about 10 or 11 minutes, and because he did get in some early foul trouble there, um, there's a couple of ticky tack calls, in my opinion. At least one of them uh, wasn't very good. And then um, Charles Coleman, I think he he played 15 minutes and had had one bucket, and then also uh, two or three boards, but. As far as it, he made a nice move or two offensively, just didn't finish um, there in the paint, um, and he had a nice, nice looking jump or semi semi hook. Guys, why don't we uh, why don't we uh, go to Ryan Robinson now? People have been sitting here all this time listening to us babble, waiting for Ryan Robinson patiently. And uh, why, why don't we go to Ryan now to come back and talk about the uh, the Liberty basketball game this weekend? Well, Bubba, we got a very special guest actually going to the game tonight for Appalachian State, right, at East Carolina. Yeah, I hope to see him up there at the Holmes Convocation Center. Um, Pirates taking on the Mountaineers and welcome into the show, East Carolina's Director of External Operations, uh, Ryan Robinson. Ryan, we appreciate you joining us. No problem, man. I'm in love. I'm sitting in a uh, hotel room right, right now overlooking the beautiful city of Boone. First time I've ever visited and uh, looking forward to a really, a really good basketball game against you know a really good team that they're playing. So it should be a good night for the Pirates. Uh, Ryan, uh, we always talk about how great you and John are, and I just wanted to can you confirm or deny that we're on the payroll at East Carolina for the guys at the sports detective? <laughs> We've actually hired you guys as uh, freelancers, so we can pay you freely. Uh, there's no set salary, so we, we do appreciate it. <laughs> And, uh, you know, but I will tell you, you know, we take, you know, everybody, every all feedback, and you all have given some great feedback. We take it seriously. Um, I had an email today from a random fan that, uh, man, she made, she made like five really good points. And uh, that's the kind of feedback that, that I appreciate it because you can't have thin skin in this business. No question about it. We wanted to bring you on because, uh, obviously, Pirates on a bye week. But I want to get your thoughts on uh, – I was telling folks, uh, there are people that don't realize the amount of hours you work. I know that you and John have um, – uh, I, I equated things to uh, – the analogy I use is like we're in a, like a hole, um, but the good news is we're getting out of the hole and uh, definitely a breath of fresh air. Uh, I hate to use the term right to ship, but it just feels like with you guys being in charge and then – the coaching hires that uh, John, you guys have made. Uh, we're very happy with Tim McNeil. Obviously, Coach yeah. Houston, I know, was the first hire that John made, and you guys, uh, I, I'm really happy with the progress that we see with the coaching hires and certainly the program as a whole. Yeah, we, you know, we have an unbelievable staff that is here, and I think the main thing 
at a meeting yesterday, and what I'm starting to see is there's a commitment from our, our staff. Um, you know, they, they believe purple and gold, and I think they're starting to see it. I mean, I do too. Um, you know, I, last week I drove to Annapolis, uh, took a couple student athletes there. You know, this week I'm in Boone, and, and you know, John is staying back to go to the women's game. So there, there's just a commitment from a lot of different people to get this thing right. And, you know, what our football team has done over the last two weeks has been impressive. But really what's been impressive for me is they, you know, they've gotten better each week. And, and I think that's that's important as you, um, as you build a program. Brian. Ryan, I gotta give you credit for keeping for keeping straight here and answering the question with that annoying sound of somebody's whistle in the background because I'm dying. Oh yeah, I can tell Bub is going up the. Uh, he must be going up the mountain. <laughs> oh, you know, has he not figured out the mute button? Yeah, somebody had uh, Ryan. What kind of feedback are you? That getting? actually, that actually is not me. I I heard the same thing. That is, yeah, I think it's Dave. I think it's Dave because I, I I had it on mute. So uh, in where I am, uh, it's it's definitely dry. I heard those sound like windshield wipers. Yeah, I, heard, I think it's Dave. But I was over here cracking up. But Ryan, <laughs> what kind of feedback are you getting so far uh, from fans positively? Everybody always wants to talk about the negative. But what, what are you hearing that people are liking this year with changes that have been made? Uh, to, to game day. Well, I think the biggest thing has been, um, you know, it, it sounds small, but the kids zone has been extremely popular. And I don't know uh, any of you all if you have kids, but, you know, you go to that kid zone for football an hour before a game and then about 30 minutes and then at halftime, it, it's, it's hard to find a spot. Like, we need to expand it. And it really goes back to, giving people options. Uh, yeah, we still on alcohol. If you don't want alcohol, there, there's other things to drink. Uh, trying to be, we need to be a little bit better probably in more selections for food. Um, I think just the different areas. Now, the one thing we've learned is our footprint is kind of changing. Um, you know, I wasn't here in the past, but I know before the game you had a lot of Pirate Club members in Menji's and you had that Dowdy store. Well, a lot of stuff is drifting to the south side now. Um, you know, that's where our biggest seller is right now for Dowdy and uh, merchandise. Uh, some of our biggest concessions are on that side. Obviously, we have the kids on. But I spent a lot of time at the Cincinnati game in the um, Williams Park Club. And I tell you what, that is an impressive place. And we're not going to forget about it. Those people are valuable. And I think we can do some cosmetic things that can really improve that area. But really just learning about uh, the different areas um, of the stadium, what's popular, what's not. Uh, obviously, the Town Bank Tower speaks for itself. I uh, haven't had a, a lot of complaints about that area. But, hey, listen, we got to fix, you know, I'll, I'll go over a couple small things that, that are not really small. Obviously, we have some stuff going on with our score, with our uh, video board that is really out of the people, you know, it's not human error. It's really we got to fix the board. Um, you know, sometimes our sound system gets a little out of whack. So there's a lot of little things that we're looking at. Um, but, you know, one of the things I'm real happy about this year, we got to honor as many teams as possible, you know, other uh, sporting teams on campus at games. So we're just trying to add as much as possible, but not, um, you know, everything's got to be to enhance the experience. But we got a lot to work on on football. I mean, I'm still unhappy that first game, you know, our concessions and some other things. We they weren't, we just weren't ready, and and that was disappointing. But I think we answered the bell the second week. So there's a lot of things. I mean, I could talk forever about things we need to improve on. I do think from the men's basketball and women's basketball side, uh, after the first couple games for women and men, people are really happy with some of the changes made to menus in terms of the the exterior and the graphics and the court. So that, that's a positive. I was going to tell you, the court and the lighting and Menji's, oh, my gosh, that's the best. I think that's court. Uh, Bubba and Kyle, can you all chime in on it? I think that's the best the court's ever looked. Yeah, really a lot brighter, too. lighter. The, the, yeah. the, 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 the mid-court logo, I love the State of Mind logo on the football field. I've never liked it on the basketball court, to be honest. Um, yeah, Kyle, uh, a lot of people have said that. 
So it, it looked great. Um, we we got more stuff we got to do. You know, I'm not a big fan, and no one is. Uh, when you come into Minji's, the tile floors. Uh, yeah. I don't want to give what, I don't want to give out too much, but in the month of December, you might not be walking on tile floors anymore. Right. Uh, breaking news, so we're we're looking into that. Uh, that's getting rid of those tile floors will really change um, the entrance into to Minji's. So. And we're constantly. I, I'm going to the App State game tonight. Tomorrow, I'm I'm actually going to go to the Greensboro Swarm game and then the Wake Forest basketball game just to kind of look at what other people are doing and how we can get better. Um, because we got a staff that they want to get better. They're open for suggestions. So uh, we're just getting started. I'm right out of clip. I wanted to discuss on the football side something you mentioned about the scoreboard. Two things. Yes. Um, one, I, I, I love the video that was added a couple games ago uh, that, you know, you can feel the tide turning and, you know, the oceans rising. Yeah. I, I, I like that a lot. I don't know whose idea that was. but uh, That was Eric, Eric Ward and our marketing. He's really good. Yeah, I liked it a lot. And then the other thing, you, you mentioned the scoreboard. Um, if I remember right, it's been 10 years now. I believe IMG paid for that full board. I don't know if that's something you would yeah, know or not. Yeah, and we were just, John Gilbert and I were talking about today. I mean, you know, somebody, John said, he said, hey, Ryan, what do you think a new board would cost? I mean, as you all know in this business, that can range from, you know, a million to, you know, 15 million. So it, I don't want to say right now that it is, we have some other things that are really priorities. Um, now it'd be nice to get in the board. I think what's happening is there's some wiring and stuff going on in the back um, that sometimes when it gets real hot, it overheats. And you all see, like sometimes during starting lineups, there's like one little block, that mm-hmm. and um, yeah. that's frustrating. But it's frustrating for me. It's frustrating for Gray Pierce and Brandon Smith, who are two of the best in the business. So we're dealing with it. You know, we did get it. For men's basketball, if y'all hear that beep in, that is Drew still calling me. He calls me twice a day, and he'll probably <laughs> call me 50 times while I'm on this interview. But um, <laughs> it's just part of, it's part of my life. He calls me at 103, and then it must be 556. I don't know. I'm looking at my watch, but it must be nearing that. But that's just <laughs> the second time. But yeah, I mean, I think you know we got a new horn for basketball that I'm still I like it. Um, you know, we, we kind of have a running joke in our office that, you know, we bought, we spent money to buy a new horn and people are still complaining and I get it. It just sounds different, but, um, I'm happy that we got that done. We have some stuff in Minji's with the boards, um, you know, and, and for football, just think about adding LED boards. Yeah. You know, you oh, cool. see that scoreboard there in the, in the end zone. I mean, you look at, some LED boards, maybe some LED boards underneath um, Town Bank Tower. You know where the sign says Town Bank Tower in that area? But That would be cool. As someone once told me, guys, uh, you can do a lot with money. What, um, <laughs> that's, that's an understatement. But yeah. you know, I was asking you about LED. How, how much is it and how realistic is it? I, I've seen, you know, at Alabama, uh, that you know, after every touchdown now, it's a light show. Uh, I've seen ODU utilize yeah. the LED lights at halftime to do a light show. I've seen uh, Fort Atlantic doing it. Is that it's, something you know, that we can realistic. do? Yeah, it's realistic. I mean, um, it's one of the things we'd like to get in baseball, too. Um, oh, cool. Know, obviously, you all have seen at baseball we've had some lights issues. So uh, I think it was in the, what is it, the regional last year or some other game where – they went off for about 20 minutes. So, listen, we we got to improve those areas, but, um, you know, you only have so much money to go around. One of the things, too, that we have a really need for is we have, I don't know if you all seen the new turf practice field that, you know, okay. soccer, lacrosse, yes. baseball. Well, it doesn't have lights right now. So I'm um, not saying that we have to get lights there, but, that would be nice. And then I think at the end of the day, something people don't talk about a lot, I would love to see a weight, a, another weight room like a lot of colleges have. Listen, we've got 19 sports. You try to send them all in one weight room and do all the schedules, I think it would be pretty cool to have one near that team's building uh, right outside the soccer uh, Johnson Stadium 
another weight room for more of our student athletes. So, I mean, I could go on. I mean, John Gilbert and I sit around all the time and just and dream and talk about different things. Uh, but right now, I would say branding and graphics is really high uh, on our priority list. I had a question Ryan. for you, Ryan, regarding yeah. uh, the elephant in the room. How close – can you give us breaking news? How close are we to an indoor practice facility? Because that's the uh, – uh, I know that's a dream, uh, hoping that can come into reality sooner than later. I know it's, it's a lot of money, and we have to raise it, but I'm hoping to see something on that in 2020. Yeah, you know, I, I have to be – I like you guys, so I'm going to be honest. Um, has it been talked about? Yes. But I, I can't tell you that – I can tell you, like, no plans have been drawn or anything. I think it's – you have to think about it. it. It is a very expensive thing. You could build one – and kind of go the, you know, there's some people that build it that don't have, like, sides to it. It's just kind of a covering. UAB. Well, yeah, well, the problem is it's still not safe under light. So, um, you know, that's our biggest issue is, is lighting. I will tell you, I don't know how many practices we have missed this year. I, I don't want to say it's a bunch. I know Coach Houston sent me a text today because uh, I'm not in Greenville, but I think it was coming down pretty good and it was cold. So it's been a great day to go inside. Um, but listen, do we need one? Yes. Uh, there's a lot of things, a lot of variables that go into that. Uh, when you do a project of, I mean, let's just throw out a number, fifteen, twenty million dollars, uh, you would need someone to make a pretty substantial leadership gift. You know, David, just because, I mean, that's a lot of money just to raise with five thousand. Well, Kyle's got 5, it. Five thousand there, and that's Kyle's got a massive it. sports objective. Wanted to purchase it. And we put that on outside the field house. It'd be nice. <laughs> now, I can tell you what, if I had a lot of money, I would have, I would have, uh, as soon as y'all got there, I would have paid wrote the check, my friend. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know if Bubba has a question that he wants to get in, but I, I just want to follow up on it. I know you said there's okay. no plans thrown up. And, uh, and it, it seems to be, you know, at least during the offseason, Coach Houston seems to be something he really wanted. And I think yeah. to keep up with the Joneses in, in FBS football, I think we need one. I mean, I think, you know, I, I need to take a look at everybody else in the state. Bubba may know the answer to this, but we may be the only FBS school outside of Charlotte that doesn't have one. Um, no, I agree. We we need one. I, I'd, I'd be lying to you if I told you we need one because here's the thing, guys. Yeah, it's great for football. It's also great for other sports to be able to practice indoor. Um, so, you know, you have areas around, you know, you have areas around campus where, or around our footprint that works. Um, it, it's just, you know, we're kind of in the stages of, you know, how do you want to do it, how, built, how big do you want it to be, and how are you going to pay for it? Um, so, and, and I look at the other side, you know, we just got done with the Town Bank Tower. Um, you, you, you hope that people, if you started something with that, that they're going to rally around it. I don't know the answer to that. You all probably know better what people are saying on the outside, but, you would need buy-in from a lot of people to make it happen. But, no, Coach Houston, I mean, he, he's not going to take that off his his list. And, and I don't blame him because he's trying to build uh, a program that kind of can compete with anybody and, you know, the word I always use, has sustained success. And I truly believe, and I told Coach Houston this yesterday, when this team wins a game, their next game, I think they're going to get on a roll. I think it's just getting over that hump. Uh, I do think now they believe they can win. I don't think early in the year they truly believed they were going to go out and win. But now uh, he's, built, he's building something. And you got two weeks left in the season, fellas. And a lot of people, I told our staff yesterday, a lot of people are going to say, oh, you got one more home game. It is what it is. Hey, that's the most important game of the year. Uh, you you want to finish this off season with some momentum. Uh, we are going to put some season tickets on sale in January and kind of have a nine-month payment plan gives people more options. You put less down. Uh, so I'm excited about that because we have to increase our season tickets because you guys, I don't know what you think about the crowds this year. Listen, I'm grateful for anybody that walks through that stadium and supports the Pirates. But the bottom line is you're not going to get back to 40 or 50 when you have a low season ticket base because at William & Mary game, we sold 9,000 single game tickets. That was like the most since 2014 single game. Wow. So, so we're we're making progress, but when your season ticket base is low, it's going to be tough to get to to fifty. But I'm just grateful. I, John and I talked about this. Very happy with our crowds this year. 
Um, I mean, they, they want to see a, a team that's going to win, but hopefully they're seeing it's a team that's going to compete. And uh, it, it's on the rise. And, you know, our home schedule next year um, is pretty is very competitive. So it's a good time to be a Pirate. Um, I do want to see this men's basketball team get rolling here this year. And I think Kim McNeil, somebody I've become really close to, um, is passionate and has a plan of how to build this program like it's never been built before. Ryan, I had a comment for you and then also a question. The comment I – Earlier you were talking about Minji's, and I've seen the graphics, the, the East Carolina b- basketball, and that looks awesome. And then also um, in the stairwells uh, where you have the EC victory, um, the words of the fight yeah. song, uh, I, I thought that looks awesome as well. Yeah, we got some We the East. I don't know if you all have seen those. And then you, we've got some more stuff around midcourt, uh, you know, where it says like Section 113. You're going to start to see the brand pattern on, you know, both sides of, like, Section 113 and I believe Section 106, um, just trying to find ways to add to it. I mean, one of the things we're talking about right now, we, we desperately need new chairs for our benches and for our courtside seats. But I'll tell you, fellas, we added 16 courtside seats for men's basketball, and they sold out in about wow. two days. So people are excited. No one wants, no one wants it more than Joe Dooley. Uh, I, I've become friends, you know, really respect Joe and what he's doing because Joe Dooley is a heck of a basketball coach, and he cares about East Carolina, and it means something to him to get this program going back. Because really, guys, let's be honest. I mean, I think it's three winning seasons in 25 years. Yep. Uh, so I think the kids believe that they have an opportunity to kind of leave a legacy here. So it's exciting now. You know, you're, you're playing, like this week, is a perfect example. Appalachia State's a good basketball team, and then Liberty's receiving votes in the top 25. So yeah. you, you got to be realistic. It's a young team without, you know, possibly two of their better players not playing right now. And my question was, um, I know when we talked to you back in the spring, um, obviously during baseball season, you talked about how how well the dollar hot dogs went over at Clark Leclerc Stadium. Um, much is made of the, the drop in concessions prices on certain items like nachos and uh, pretzels, hot dogs, so forth. Uh, so, talk a little bit about how that um, how that has gone in football, and then um, also maybe not a specific number, but just talk about how the the beer and wine sales have gone. Well, I mean, you make a good point, Kyle. I, I couldn't sit here and tell you that you know we're not. We're not generating a ton of revenue from when you lower prices, but that's part of the decision we made was to add to the fan experience with uh, fan-friendly concessions. And a lot of it, too, is what we're learning about our footprint and all the different options fans have. You know, what I'm learning, and you guys already know this, this is a huge tailgating place. So there's not a lot of people hungry when they go into football games. So I'm learning a little bit about that. Alcohol sales, I mean, you're probably talking, I mean, just tell you the first three games, you're probably talking about gross 50000 Um, But here, you have to look at it this way now. You have people in the suites that aren't buying beer. You have, uh, you know, people in the trade club are buying alcohol. And then, you know, you have, uh, you have what? 9,000 students, not many of them are buying alcohol. So, you know, I saw some of the numbers that North Carolina has, and we're not to that level. I think we've got to continue to evaluate. Our prices are the lowest in the state. So uh, we've got to continue to evaluate um, and how we can improve that service. I mean, I watched it at Menji's, the basketball game the other day, and, there, you know, there's people, you know, buying alcohol there. It hasn't been out. I mean, I can't sit here and tell you it's been this unbelievable revenue generator, but it is the first year. No question. Before we let you go, thank you. I know we've kept you longer than. No, no problem. Than, you just uh, you kept Drew still from asking me what I've had for what I'm going to have for dinner tonight. I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, we have a question putting you on the spot, obviously, but we won't really bad for the spring game to get Bon Jovi any way possible that we can. I know we're killing you with asking about indoor practice so have, facility and then Bon Jovi for the spring game. Is that possible? Why Bon Jovi? Well, because Bon Jovi has mass appeal. 
Yeah. He uh, he's gonna living on a prayer is a big deal for football games. No country, uh, you know, like y'all know, wouldn't have a country singer. Do what now? No. You wouldn't you wouldn't go the country route. Well, we've oh, done absolutely. that before. Look, oh, if we're, we're going to talk country music, I'm I'm going to throw y'all off because I'm going to start talking guys like Cody Jinks and Taylor Childers and Whiskey Myers. <laughs> um, some 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 good outlaws. Didn't they? Sure. Didn't they? Didn't they try Blake Shelton here a couple of years ago? I understand. He, he didn't show up. We we had yeah. Eric Church and Kid well, Rock, uh, and it was a failure. Not because Eric Church and Kid Rock, because we had some goofy company instead the of company like was Live the problem, Nation. not the act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Live, the, the, the promoter. Using somebody like Live Nation, we used some goofy promotion company that the previous administration hired, and uh, it was uh, it was a disaster. No, I would love it. You know, we're we're talking right now about the spring game. Um, you know, what we can do, you know, something Friday night, even with the football, you have the spring game. But I think now having that town bank tower, just that side, you know, if you can get baseball to play on the same weekend, softball, I mean, you could do some pretty cool stuff. I don't know the date of our spring game. For some reason it tells me it's in that uh, – I know Coach had talked about that 10th, 11th, or 12th, but I, I could be wrong on the date, but I know it's around there. Um and and then I will tell you, stay tuned for an announcement here. Probably the next couple of weeks, we are going to do a, a, a signing day deal for the public. I believe that's December 18th. Uh, we're kind of working through the logistics of where we can do it. I've been a part of these in the past, and it's a great opportunity, you know, for fans to come for free and really hear from Mike and the coaches about all the recruits we just signed. So stay tuned on that. We're, we're actually meeting about it tomorrow. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ryan, so much. Uh, uh, get a win. I know you, you and Bubba can get a win tonight in, uh, in Boone at Appalachian State with uh, Joe Dooley and the Pirates. And uh, bring a, a win back home to Greenville, will you? Oh, I will. And I just got a hey, call. Now, what was the name of those two bands you just said? Oh, the bands that I was naming that, that yeah. I like? Yeah. Uh, Cody Jinks. Uh, that was I know him. Taylor Childers, uh, Whiskey Myers. Uh, that's, uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what kind of mass appeal that would be to Pirate Nation. Those, <laughs> those are just my my personal favorites. I'm into a lot of outlaw country. So. Well, guys, man, I always enjoy going on with you. Call me anytime. All right, thanks, man. Thanks. Bye. Ryan, thanks. Uh, great job as always. Always good to hear from you. A lot of great details there, uh, Bubba. Sounds like uh, some breaking news from Ryan about. Uh, some changes to the entrance there of uh, Minji's getting rid of some tiles. Yeah, that's what that was a little breaking news for us, like you said, and that's what I recall when when Minji's opened after the renovation and the um, in the winter there January of '95 uh, dedication game. I guess it was actually James Madison, but the first game was against East Tennessee State, and we and um, not to get off on a tangent, but my. Uh, Family and I, we were going to go down for that, and uh, unfortunately, there was some uh, wintry mix there in um, in the Winston Salem area, and we weren't able to get out of Winston because of the traffic. But uh, but yeah, that that tile that you alluded to, um, that that has been there since then, uh, so it's long overdue for sure, and I can't wait to see it here in a few weeks. Good, Dave. I was just going to say, I thought it was interesting, this discussion, Kyle. You, I believe you brought it up a few months ago, back there, it's been at least that long ago, about the school board, uh, especially yeah. for football, and um, that's something that is. I think you and I talked about it way, way back when you first uh, joined me on the podcast off air. Um, but we've been talking about the school board for a long, long time. It made me think about when he, he's mentioning about baseball. It made me think about the days when uh, the lights were messed up in Harrington Field in baseball, um, and it just seemed like. But uh, yeah, us, and, and it sounds like we're going to re- repair the school board rather than replace it. Uh, if I remember yeah. right, I thought IMG or ISP or whoever the hell it was at the time paid for that, uh, paid for that scoreboard, and I, I don't guess maybe they're not willing to this time around. I don't know. It it needs to be replaced. Yep. I, I, I do think, uh, and, and I don't know how much of an investment that is. I, I don't know if we replace it with something the same size, but. In full HD, I mean, I, I don't, I have no idea how much of an investment that is. I, I guess it sounds like maybe we're gonna repair it so we don't have the pixelation problems. Um, and I guess that's fine. I, but at some point, uh, it's going to be replaced, and you know, like, along with the, uh, and it sounds like you know that they're not ready to really start a serious fundraising program for the um, 
practice facility, and I get it. I mean, we just built the uh, the the town big tower, but the the indoor practice facility is something that needs to be looked at. Um, I tell you what people, worries. I tell you what worries me, guys, is the very fact that my concern, and I will just put it out there. This is just me, so. Um, Kyle has brought the, the best to me as far as giving my concerns or putting them out there. My concern is I'm worried when I – I know that they're talking about the indoor practice facility, but I'm worried if the money is not there for the town bank tower. I'll just go ahead and put it out there. I've been debating on whether I should mention that in the last few weeks anyway, but I'm saying it now. I'm just worried that, that they're worried that the money's not there. I don't know that to be true, so please don't – I'm not trying to start rumors. Well, I'm just, you know – Something I'm worried about. I'll say this, uh, about ticket sales, about Comic Tower, about the people that pledged the money and all, I'll say this, next fall, all that stuff's going to start taking care of itself. Right. Uh, when, 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 when this offense is, when we're beating, when, you know, when we're beating Marshall or South Carolina or somebody early next year and uh, we start winning, uh, all that kind of stuff will suddenly become a lot easier because the excitement will return. I mean, hell, right. there's been a little buzz just from almost beating Cincinnati and SMU. Yeah. Think about when we actually start doing it. And it's going to be good. Hey, hey, and, and very quickly, Kyle's going to be talking about the buzz. That's what I was listening to the South Carolina podcast. And needless to say, they, they as you would expect, were very ticked off over what happened over the weekend. And uh, not so much even losing to Appalachian, but just the way they had zero offense and couldn't run the ball. But, uh one of their fans um, had obviously been well versed on Coach Houston and his background and what's taking place the transformation in Greenville. So he was saying that South Carolina need to hire Mike Houston. <laughs> well, that's a good. That's I, I don't, a good thing. Fortunately, I don't think that's going to happen yet. But I'll tell you what, I bet they give Mustang up another year. And with the way he recruits South Carolina and with his yeah. ties down there. If we go do something like win eight or nine, ten games next year, you know who knows what's going to happen. But let's just say, let's just say, for shits and giggles, we, we go eight and four, nine and three next year, and they fire Mustang. But it wouldn't be surprised to see him on their short list. I hope that's not the case. I hope he stays here longer than two years. But you know, it, it, that's a lot of ifs and buts. But if that happens, then what we got to make sure we do is turn around and make the right hire again. That's the biggest thing. You, you know. There's tons of schools that lose coach after coach after coach. Look at Arkansas State, the turnover they had there for several years. Yeah. And the key is just to hire, to get the hire right. If you hire the next guy right, look at you, look at UCF. Uh, you know they lost uh, they lost Scott Frost and hired um, Josh Heupel. And you know I think suddenly some of their fans think nine and three is unacceptable, but they had a great year last year. I mean. That's the key. I don't want to lose Coach Houston after next year. And granted, we're getting way ahead of ourselves, Bubba. But yeah. if, if we do, just get the hire right next, and it'll be all right. And a couple other great examples of that, so not as frequently as Arkansas State was, where they had something like five head coaches in five years or four in four years. But um, you also, within the American, Cincinnati did a pretty good job of it. And, and uh, an even better example is Temple. With Cincinnati, you had Tuberville that had a, a couple down years, but at, at Temple, um, they've kept things rolling since Al Golden got it going, and then Steve Adazio, et cetera. Matt Rule, yeah. I mean, it's, it's you, you can do it. It's just you know you got to make sure you you make you make the right decisions. And I, when you're in that position, when you're when when a coach is leaving and you're making a hire, you're in a lot better situation than you are when you fire a coach, particularly at this level. And, uh, you know, I you look at, look at when Skip left, you know, we hired Ruffin and, and think about how that went. That went well. Uh, think about when we fired Logan and we fired Ruff, how the next big coaches went. Not too good. It, it's, it's a lot easier. And, and, and granted, again, we're getting way ahead of ourselves, but, um, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out over the next couple of years. Uh, I, I definitely thank Coach Houston. Because of his background as being so successful in winning national championships at the FCS level, I think if he wins here, and because of his dynamic personality, 
if he wins here, he will become a hot candidate. Oh, I totally agree. No, no doubt about it. So, Bob, we have uh, we, we we got we got another guest. This is a three for here. Uh, we have a uh, former East Carolina running back Brandon Simmons, and Bubba, tell them why we have Brandon on. Yeah, when we caught up with the former Pirate running back uh, from the Skip Holtz era, and that's what Brandon is now a uh, teacher and coach in the high school ranks, and prior to his current position at Green Level High School there in the greater Raleigh area. He was um, a coach uh, with Millbrook and had the opportunity to coach Tyler Sneed. Obviously, Tyler Sneed has certainly made his presence felt here in his redshirt freshman season with East Carolina and had 19 catches for 230 or 40 yards and three touchdowns last weekend against SMU. And so we and had a chance to catch up with Brandon to talk about Tyler and several other topics. And let's go to that interview with Brandon Simmons right now. Well, Bubba, we've been wanting to have him back football season. I don't know. It seems like they're trying to get our schedules together. Very happy to have our next guest. Yeah, a guy who played for the Pirates, uh, Brandon Simmons. Uh, Brandon, welcome to the show. Hey, gl- glad, you got, glad you guys can have me, man. I do appreciate it as always. Great times. Well, I'll tell you what, if there's a guy that knows how to rebuild a program, uh, you, i tell you, we've got that. And looks like we have one with Coach Mike uh, Houston at the college level. First of all, we're going to be talking about uh, one of the guys that used to play for you, so we're going to talk about Tyler Sneed. But first, before we do that, uh, get your thoughts on your former player. Uh, we t- had you on uh, before. Well, let, let, let's, let's let Brandon tell everybody where he's coaching at. Not everybody's going to know where we're okay. Yeah, but tell everybody uh, where you coach at, Brandon, and what you're doing now, so people will know about you coaching Tyler Sneed. Yeah, well, well, first things first. Um, you know, I, I'm currently coaching at the newest school in North Carolina, the newest school in Wake County, Green Level High School, which is located in Cary, North Carolina. Uh, we're part of the Tri Eight Football Conference. We're a fra- fairly new school, but the older members in our conference is Durham Jordan. Durham Hill, yeah. Hillside, Green Hope, Panther Creek, um, the list goes on and on, you know. So, but uh, but that's where that's currently where I coach at. Um, on paper, I'm the quarterback coach, but on the field, um, I'm actually the backfield coach. So I have the quarterback, the the uh, the dive back or the B back or the fullback, and then I also have the slot receivers as well. And the reason we wanted to have you on tonight was one of your former players. That yet where you were at previously, uh, Tyler Sneed is having a, a he had a breakout. Well, I wouldn't want to call it a breakout game, correct? <laughs> against SMU because he's already he's already you know been a star, but he took it he to a whole other level Saturday. He, he has been, and, and you know Tyler, um, you know I, I I actually keep up with him quite often, but but I but I had the the great opportunity to work with him closely at Millbrook High School um, for for us. He he was everything. He was a, a running back, a pitch back, a receiver, um, a punt returner, a kick returner. So um, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm in the Tyler Sneed uh, fan club, no doubt about it. Wanted to ask you as far as uh, one of those moments. How do you um, when you see a kid like him? Did you? Uh, I know you told us he was great. When did you know that he was? When you were coaching him at Millbrook, when did you know that he was special? When he was great. Well, so so Tyler, um, the thing about Tyler is that on day one, I, I never forget it. The very first time that I saw the kid practice, um, and, and be mindful, you know, at Millbrook, we had a number of quality, elite, big time players that are coming out. Um, but but out of everybody, he, he was one of the smaller guys, but he he had the the, the competitive nature that, in my opinion, it takes to be a champion. Um, no matter who the guy was in front of him, um, he took it personal when when the defender attempted to cover him. Um, he brought his lunch pail every single day, um, every single weight room session. He's trying to be the, the strongest guy in the room, um, and he's just the ultimate competitor. So, you know that. You know, in a nutshell, you know that Tyler. I mean, he he worked his tail off. He worked his tail off, and as long as long as I've known him. He's had that same moxie and attitude everywhere he's been. Brandon, what's you know, Tyler's recruiting process like? I mean, obviously, well, well, so, well, so, so the way it goes is that you, you, you guys know, man. You guys follow rivals. You guys follow all yeah. of the big, big recruiting sites. You know, he basically what it was was that um, recruiters knew he can play, 
but everyone, from my yeah. knowledge, basically held his sides against him. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and made no mistake, you know, I, I coached in junior college, and, and I, you know, obviously played in college, so I know exactly what they look for in certain types of players at certain types of positions. But at the same time, I just think far too many recruiters get caught up in the numbers, and, and, and at the end of the day, it's about what happens when you play the tape. Like, your tape is the resume, and all I know is that every time he touched the ball for us, um, I grabbed my popcorn because he was putting on the show. You know what I'm saying? You... Uh-huh. Go ahead. I'm no, go ahead. Yeah, no, and, and, and that's just what he is. I mean, he, he salt block. Um, he gets open. Um, very selfless individual. He, he oftentimes coached up the, the younger players. Um, and, you know, he's even a better dude. Like, his whole family is committed to excellence. They're all blue collar. They all give back to, to the community. And um, you know he comes he he comes from a great a great family too you know so the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And you know what's funny is that he actually uh, didn't you say that he has his family went to NC State side so that yeah I think, yeah so so uh, just a quick overview of him and I'm not gonna get you know give you a long winded answer but you know his father was a baseball player at NC State his mother was a cheerleader at NC State his older sister was a gymnast at at UGA. And his two youngest sisters, who were a part of my pop, my uh, my powder puff team, um, they they believe it or not, they're faster than him. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, he comes from oh, and his his um, they, they're close to the pro family, um, you know, Ricky Pro and and you know Austin Pro and all those boys. They they're they're you know they they're a tight knitted family, um, but I mean. They get it, like he gets it. You know what I'm saying? Like a, a guy with with that with with that much support tends to in, in today's time tends to be very arrogant and very selfish. But you know this kid right here is the complete opposite, and I can honestly stand on the ledge and say that. You know, so um, but I, but I'm happy to see that he he finally getting his opportunity with this regime um, because, like I said before, he pride himself on working hard every single day. Um, with CJ back healthy for, for UConn, uh-huh. you know, maybe they'll have a competition on who can catch the most balls in the game. Maybe they'll, <laughs> maybe they'll, they'll, they'll both set a record in one look, game. Look, man, look, if that happens, you, hey, watch out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what do you think of the offense, this, this dramatic turn this offense has taken? And, and, and Houston and Donnie Kay have traded it all to starting some young offensive linemen kind of because of the injury and Maybe we should have been starting them all along. <laughs> well, well, well. What's that? So, so my 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 two cents worth, man. You know, I, I mean, I, I'm watching the game for what it is. What I see is that, um, you know, for example, Holton, man, he he's, he's playing like he used to play in high school. He's not doing as much thinking. He's just going off of his his natural right. ability. He's believing what he's seeing. You know what I'm saying? The game is also slowing down for him. And I also think that Coach Kurt Kurt Patrick. And the whole staff understands the importance of scaling down the game plan for younger players, and 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 it's just more than anything else. Like the passing concepts that I see out there are very very simple. Um, the run game is very very simple. Like everything is is super duper simple. And again, I I credit the coaching staff for not only making personnel adjustments but shrinking their playbook so that. The guys can play faster. You know, what yeah, I'm saying? And, so and it it's didn't happen all at once, but it seems like it did. It well, seems well, like it, all of a sudden the switch went off. Well, well, so yeah, and, and and the thing about it is, is what I what I think happened was I think that you know, just being honest about the situation, he you know, Holton knew that he wasn't playing the best. You know, what I'm saying like he knew he wasn't, but I also think that when he started hearing more and more chirp about, okay, guy, you had your opportunity to kind of move in a different direction. I think that he took it personal, and the mark of a competitor is taking that criticism bottling it in, and then doing something about it. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, for the past two games, to be honest, he's been box office. You know what I'm saying? And if 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 this is the guy that we're going to get every single game moving forward, we're going to be okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, we just will be, you know. So, but again, a credit to those guys who are getting it done. And Brandon, one of those guys that – I was going to quickly say, Brandon, we'll, uh, sorry, Brandon. I was going to say, Bubba, really quick. Uh, Brandon, uh, you know, there was a lot of those folks talking about he should move over to tight end. Where are those, where are those uh, men and women now? Where are they now? Well, well, to be honest, man, and, and I'm going to call it spade to spade, they're still there. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're still there, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, you still got to win games. But I do think that if he continues to play the way he is playing right now, I think that he will never 
hear that type of talking anymore. And the only reason I say it is because, you know, ECU is known for putting out quality quarterbacks. Like, like we just are, you know what I'm saying? Obviously, receivers have something to do with it, uh, defensive linemen, running backs. But, you know, I hate to say it, but Pirate Nation has sort of kind of been spoiled by the greatness of the quarterback position, you know what I'm saying, like over the years. Like you could just name them from the David Garage to the Crandall to, you know, the, obviously James Pickney, Pat, Patrick Pickney, and Shane yeah, Carter. Definitely. Like the list goes on and on. Like we've had some pretty darn good quarterbacks throughout our career that can get it done, you know what I'm saying? So when people are critical of his production, um, they're measuring him against some of the all-time greats, you know what I'm saying, that have won championships, that have won bowl games, and just flat out complete. Yeah, and if you guys, if you guys I, I'm sure you have, I, I, I think Bubba, right now we're starting with one senior on the line, literally every damn body on the offense is back. Pena is the only one I can think of, right? Yeah. Brandon Pena. Yeah, everybody's back to opinion. That's insane. Well, well, well if you're going to bite, you're going to bite as a pup. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's just something that was always passed along through Skip. Like, they just called it straight up. They say, hey, listen, man, like, you know, if you're going to bite, you're going to bite as a pup. So it doesn't matter how old you are. If you got fighting you, we're going to figure out a way to utilize you to help us be successful. And those younger guys want an opportunity. The older guys had their chance. It didn't work out, and it's all good, nothing personal, but the younger guys are getting their opportunity, and, and, and they're making the most of it. And, again, kudos to them for, for taking advantage of it. Yeah, Brandon, you, and Brandon, you played running back. Um, obviously, we came into the year, Darius Penix was the man, and so he went down against Gardner-Webb, and then so it's, we've seen several guys there. Um, Demetrius Mooney and Trace Christian have gotten the bulk of the carries, um, but then this past weekend you saw Tay Williams, um, Coach Houston said that his pass protection had gotten a lot better, and as a result, you saw him get 14 carries uh, for, I think, 65 yards, something like that. But um, just talk a little bit about what you've seen at the running back position with each of those guys. Well, to be honest with you, like, and, and, and I'm, you know, I'm obviously very critical of that position, obviously, because of my size and all that good stuff. Um, so, so, you know, it's very personal. But what, but what I saw was. Um, guys that were they, like they would see the hole, but instead of them sticking their toe in the ground and getting vertical north to south, they were sort of kind of hesitating. And by that time, the, um, the offensive alignment was disengaged with the defensive alignment, and the defensive alignment was making plays. Made no mistake, that, yeah, yeah. made no mistake, man. Um, in the American Conference, you're you're playing some cats every every single weekend. Like this league is putting out some of the premier defensive linemen. Yeah, you know, in, in all the college, you know what I'm saying. So, so there, you know, there, there's definitely not a slouch there. But I just think a lot of it just has to do with the offensive linemen gelling together. Um, they're getting stronger because I'm also starting to see movement up front, combo blocks working to backers and sometimes safeties, and also starting to see running backs come alive by breaking tackles, making people miss, and finishing falling falling forward, which wasn't always the case um, earlier in the year. It feels like they've got a lot of confidence too, don't you think, Brandon? Oh, confidence, confidence is everything. Is Absolutely, yeah, confidence is everything. But but again, in order for you to become an elite running back, you have to also understand the blocking scheme. You know, I mean, for example, it, no matter where I go as a coach, my ultimate goal, whenever I'm working with running backs, is to show them what the offensive lineman blocking rules is, so that they can learn how to set up their blocks. And and I just think that, like for example, even when I was at um, at ECU. I would sit in the offensive line meeting room with Coach Shank so I can understand the blocking scheme so I can know how to cut up field or know when to cut it back and just, oh, you know, just becoming a better player. But I just think that a lot of those guys are starting to, to understand um, the chemistry, and because of that, um, they're able to keep pressure off of the passing game. Brandon, how uh, how Coach Houston – and the staff being uh, received by high school coaches there in the triangle. Well, well, we we we, we think highly. Like to be honest, we we think highly of Coach Houston. Um, we 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 always appreciate his his um his, his demeanor, his demeanor. Um, he comes across like a like a old school blue collar, let's get after type of coach. Uh, he is who he is, and because of that, um, we we appreciate we we appreciate that as high school coaches. You know, um, you know the fact of the matter is is that. Um, 
you know, when it comes to recruiting, the things that we as high school coaches look for in college coaches is them being real. You know, like, like, like you don't have to be a phony. Like, be who you are so that when we prepare our kids for you, okay, we feel comfortable sending um, our kids to you, you know. And, 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 again, I can say that about Coach Houston, but I definitely don't feel the same way um, about that to all recruiting or all programs across America. I just don't, you know. So, um, But it's very important. Uh, Coach Houston and his staff, they have that blue-collar mentality. And because of that, I think that um, not just myself, but many, many other coaches are going to do all we can to prepare our players to help um, him and his staff bring home championships. Brandon, in my question, uh, we got to go here in a second. And I want definitely, can we have you back on in a week or so on a playback or preview? But Absolutely. Time, uh, all right. Absolutely. Uh, we wanted to have you on, and I'm sorry for Thomas uh, running up, unfortunately. But a uh, question I had for you is uh, I have a serious question and a funny question for you. Uh-oh. But a serious question. No, no, it's not bad. <laughs> um, it's not. It's not related to football. So you want to okay. just a second? Oh, you're, you're fine. Um, no, as far as uh, this goes, how fast the guys are starting to get it? We have uh, some patient people, unfortunately. We, I know I get it. They're un, they're impatient, and because of uh, the losing season, five straight. Right. Right. Um, but how fast we see this South Carolina recruiting out of? Oh my gosh, they're getting unbelievable. The relationships with South Carolina, and I know North Carolina as well. But how fast do you think we can turn this thing around? We don't ask that the coaching staff because it's unfair, but now you're a former player. Do you think in a year or two that we could really be – it's hard to believe this fast we're competitive against Cincinnati and SMU the last two weeks? Well, so, so, so and, and, and this is just the honest God truth. It's funny because I was actually speaking with a parent about this uh, earlier in the day um, about a kid that, that's being recruited, uh, just a good friend of mine. Basically, as long as you're getting better every single week, you always give yourself a chance. And, again, like I said before, if this ECU team continues to play the way they are right now for the remainder of the season into the next year, this thing's going to get turned around in year two, no doubt about it. Like, no doubt about it. If we would have seen this ECU team right here at the top of the season, we'll be in a bowl game. We'll, we'll be going exactly. to a bowl game. We'll be no going doubt to a bowl about game. it. But it's going to take time. A uh, year or two, we should, we should um, have some conversations with some people. <laughs> And uh, what do you think about my funny – well, not really funny question, but my question is uh, off topic football. What do you think about the hurricane? Man, I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait. Uh, the, the hurricanes, man, I'm, I can't wait. Um, you know, our, my season just ended, so I get a chance to go to a few Hurricanes games, which I'm excited about. But, um, you know, if, if it's anything like it was last year, hey, man, grab your popcorn because we're going to have a good old time. I can't wait. Hey, I'm excited about Hurricane Hockey. we got to get together. And I'm tell, I told Bubba and Kyle they need to meet us there at PSG. Yeah, right man, up. yeah, come on out. Yeah, yeah, come to Raleigh, man. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Well, Brandon, thank you so much, man. And we'll definitely uh, – We'll get our hockey sticks out too, and uh, we'll definitely come up there soon. And and uh, I'm going to get once Kyle sees it, he's going to uh, in person above as well. They're going to be. If you're taking going. your hockey stick out, I'm not coming. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, man. Anytime, man. Anytime, definitely. Appreciate you, man. All right. Have a good night. All right, bye. Thank you, Brandon. I always get to catch up with Brandon. Uh, you know, sometimes I get a little aggravated with him on social media. He uh, he 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 kind of roots for the Tar Heels a little bit in shooty hoops. Uh, so, uh, shooting hoops, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so uh, I, uh, I, you know, that that bugs me. But besides that, Brandon's a stand-up guy, great, great pirate, great man, uh, and uh, a guy you can always count on. Anytime you, not only to come on the podcast, but uh, anytime we've had an event, he's always showed up and brought people with him. So uh, good, good pirate. He just, uh, he just needs to, he just needs to learn to root for pirate basketball. <laughs> but. Uh, Bob was taking power basketball Liberty this weekend, man. Liberty getting busted in the top 25 NCAA tournament team last year. Uh, big game this Saturday. Yeah, huge game against the Flames. And like you said, that's a program that, that won an NCAA tournament game a season ago. I haven't delved really far into it. Um, I, I know, um, I know they won. I think they won their opener against Maryland Eastern Shore by about 12 to 15 points. And then I'm not sure what they've done since, but, um, Big opportunity, and we certainly need a win after dropping back-to-back road games. Hopefully, 
we can get a big win over over Liberty. And um, speaking of the non-conference schedule we have in, in the recent or in the near future, you know, so let's talk about what the Evansville Purple Aces did last night, knocking off new number one uh, Kentucky at Rupp Arena in 67-64 Ev- Evansville. Yeah, shocking. I mean, I, I don't know nobody that would pick that. I mean, I, I know Evansville has a good basketball program, but to go to Kentucky, beat them, number one ranked team in America, uh, you know, I don't know what else Evansville's done this year. But uh, they'll probably be in the top 25 when we play them uh, next weekend in the Bahamas. So, uh, Tigers have an opportunity. You know, you can make these games against Navy and uh, Appalachian State a distant memory in a hurry if you can go knock off Liberty and Evansville. Yep, no doubt about it. And then Liberty and Evansville, and then there's, depending on what happens, um, there's a chance you could meet Liberty a second time. Um, at, w, at, George Washington. At, yeah. A lot of basketball to be played for sure, and um, as frustrating as these last two games have been, and a lot, and as much as uh, longtime followers and supporters of the program want to say it's the same old stuff, you got to remember that we have eleven pieces, and just be and be patient as hard as that is sometimes, and let's see how things play out, and uh, especially once we get our top two point guards back, because I'm very excited that we have Tristan Newton and. Uh, I know he's going to be a, a great pirate uh, over the next several years, but Tremont Robinson White and then also Tyree Jackson um, will make a huge difference because that's something um, coming down the stretch in that game last night, and I'm sure you noticed this, Kyle, watching it on um, ESPN Plus, is just how there were times where we were right there. It was, the game was one possession either way. We would have an ill-advised pass or – or uh, something of that nature. We just didn't get good shots, and Coach Dooley alluded to that in his post game remark. Yeah, no. Do you know when either one of those kids will be uh, will be ready to go? I know uh, Tremont Robinson White. I saw on social media that he is going to be out um, as of a couple of days ago, four more weeks from that point. So uh, it's looking like maybe mid December or so for him. Um, maybe he can be back for that Charlotte game on Sunday. The 22nd or 23rd of uh, December, whatever that is, but maybe, maybe he can be back then. Uh, it's going to be at least that long, it appears. And then as far as Tyree Jackson, uh, I think it could be sooner. I think it's kind of a week-to-week, um, game-to-game thing. Okay, well, maybe maybe we'll get him back. Uh, maybe we'll get him back for the uh, for the tournament in the Bahamas. Who knows? But uh, no, no no football game this week, as Coach Ruff says. Uh, we, would, we will beat off. <laughs> um, so uh, that'll be fun. Um I, uh, I, after that, we, we, we close it out. We got two games, close it out. Uh, Bubba, we got, uh, Connecticut, uh, up at UConn. Um, good. I hope the guys practice today. This, this is good exposure and running the offense in the cold weather today. They hopefully, uh, hopefully Coach Houston had them out there, uh, you know, in shorts, uh, <laughs> uh, getting, getting, uh, some exposure to this cold weather. I want that as an excuse when we go to UConn and, uh, we come home Thanksgiving weekend, hopefully playing for win number five against Tulsa. I hope so. Um, five and seven is what I uh, predicted preseason. And I beat, beat, beat UConn, and you have that opportunity against Tulsa. Definitely. And, and kind of something, I mean, just to touch on what you're saying, as far as going up to UConn on November 23rd and uh, playing in Probably definitely plenty cold, but then maybe uh, wet weather as well or snow. Who knows? But let, let, let's hope not. But uh, I, I just think back to that Thursday night game in 2015. Let's hope it's a better result than that. Um, but but anyway, um, I just think of Coach Houston and one of his pregame speeches that he gave at James Madison, um, just telling the team that you guys That's are like a Friday night game. Right, right, yeah, Friday night game because I, I remember I was uh, I was coaching at the time, so I remember uh, the stupid not, things not, not being able to watch that game. <laughs> but yeah, as far as the weather, I just remember Coach Houston uh, telling his James Madison team, "Hey, you guys are built to win in, in late November, early December." So obviously it's year one, but um, that was I guess only year two when he made that speech for for that Damon Mew team. So. Hopefully we'll take care of business and have the opportunity to get number five on senior day against Tulsa. Yeah, I hope so, man. It's been uh, it's been uh, 
it's sad that we, we that you know we would be excited about getting five wins, but it's it's true. It's been since 2015 since we've had five of them. Hell, it's been since 2015 that we've had four of them. Uh, first things first, let's get number four against UConn, and uh, and then uh, go for number five against Tulsa. Well, Bubba, uh, we're gonna wrap it up now, man. Um, for uh, for Dave Richmond and Bubba Rosenbaum, I'm Kyle Barber, and this has been the Sports Objective Podcast. You've been listening to the Sports Objective Podcast. Join us next time as the guys will be objective, and the objective is sports.